you all being here to take your time to come down and listen to uh, me and Starbucks Financial and our group. Uh, the information we're going to give you today hopefully will help you think about your business in a little bit different way. One of the things that we do in our business is to try to get you to turn around and, and not always go by what you hear on TV or uh, hear on the radio or hear on the internet or see on the internet. We're going to try to change things up a little bit for you today. A little bit about myself. First of all, I'm a husband and father. That's number one. Um, I'm married to a very beautiful Tracy. That's my Tracy. And I have five kids. Yes, five. Uh, my wife was uh, second married for us, so she had two kids. I had three boys. So we're almost the Brady Bunch. Not quite quite the Brady Bunch. We get that a lot. Oh, you're the Brady No, we're one short. Uh, but uh, five kids. Uh, Joshua, my oldest. And then we have Ethan, um, Alex, Joseph, and Adam. And I want to talk about a little bit about Alex because in two and a half weeks, we're going to her graduation from private uh, college in Ohio. So a little warm applause for my daughter. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the best part of that is, is that you guys are parenting. The best part is I write the last check. You know, <laughs> yeah. Amen to that. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, hope, yeah. She's coming home, so who knows, right? Uh, but no, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that, that if she's, uh, she's graduated with a communications degree. Um, and really, uh, this might be a surprise, that she's the first in our media family to have a college degree. Um, I did not. I grew up in Southern California. I was actually born in Mexico. I came here when I was five years old. Um, didn't speak a lick of English, by the way. No, no English at all. I went to uh, kindergarten, and they said, I can't come because I didn't speak English. Uh, so I did end up going first grade, and I went through the process of uh, ESL. Everybody know what ESL is, English as a second language. Went through all that. Very thankful. I had a very, very tough ESL teacher, uh, Ms. Castaneda and Mr. May. They were a, group, uh, a combined team, and they would not let me speak Spanish in school. Now, that's probably not politically correct today. Right? That they don't, in fact, they send flyers home in Spanish. But I'm very thankful that they did that. Because that got me my education started, and uh, you know I went through uh, my education in Torrance, California, where I grew up, right by the beach, um, and I was on the other side of the track. What I mean by that is the track was really behind my house. That's where I grew up. <laughs> Literally, my backyard there was a track. And for those in the oil business, uh, you'll love this: those big tankers that they have all the extra uh, fuel in. They were also in my backyard. I grew up right next to a mobile um, refinery. So I come from very humble beginnings. When I was in high school, I was 16, and my parents came to me and said, hey, guess what? Your dad's gonna lose his job in the steel factory. We're moving back to Mexico. Okay, what's that mean to me? Well, you can stay or go. So we're leaving. Wow, I'm 16. I did have a full-time job. I was going to high school. I said, well, I don't wanna go to Mexico. This is my life this year. They said, well, you're welcome to stay, but we're leaving. So they did. So I've been out of my house since I was 16. So you can imagine when I was about 17, 18, I was working, going to school, sometimes going to school, sometimes not going to school. You know, I was 18 and alone, so what the heck, right? Uh, but I was working at a pizza place, and my good friend Brad said, hey, can you go down to the recruiter with me? I'm thinking about joining the military, and I, don't, I, want, I want to make sure that they don't convince me of something that I'm not going to like, or they take advantage of me, right? Sure, I'll go with you. I was the assistant manager at this pizza place, right? <laughs> so I know what I'm talking about. So I go down there and I sit behind them and the recruiter starts. Okay, so we're going to pay for you to get an invitation. We're going to give you your clothes. We're going to give you a roof over your head and we're going to pay for all your food. And I'm like, sounds pretty good to me, right? So I did join the Air Force the very next day. Uh, and when I joined the Air Force, <clears throat> they said you take all these tests. And I haven't actually graduated high school yet. He goes, by the way, in order to join the Air Force, you have to have high school diploma. Ah, well, I'm not going to make it. He says, well, you can go take the GED. All right, go take the GED. Pass that. Got into the Air Force. The recruiter says, you have really great scores. What do you want to do? I want to be a cook. All my life, I just want to be a cook. <laughs> he goes, he looks at me and goes, you're too dang smart to be a cook. You're going to be a weatherman. A weather what? A weatherman. So I was a meteorologist for eight years in the U.S. Air Force. And uh, it was a great time, great career. The reason, the, the biggest reason I joined the Air Force, though, as you know, I was on the other side of the track, so didn't really get to see a whole lot of the Southern California. Not the best parts of LA, by the way. Uh, but I said, look, the Air Force, travel. I 
can see the world. I don't know about you, but I'm trying to find out that God has a sense of humor. So I got sent to Omaha, Nebraska <laughs> to go see the world. Wasn't that great? So I spent four years in Omaha, Nebraska, and I said to myself, well, this is just ridiculous. Here I am going to the Air Force, four years, and I end up in Cornfield, right? Now, mind you, it was a great time, great people, learned a lot, fantastic. I don't know if I just keep beeping, I probably shouldn't be walking around so much. But after four years, I said to myself, well, there's no way I'm gonna spend my four years of my military career in Omaha, Nebraska, right? So I'd be up another four years, and I got my wish. They sent me to California. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I said, God has a few things. But it wasn't over. Two years before I got out, and I was convinced that I was just gonna do eight years and get out, I got ordered to Korea, so I got to go to Japan, Alaska, South Korea for a year. Um, you know, talk a lot about Korea these days, but we, I was there in the 80s, so I'm aging myself a little bit here. Uh, after Korea, I got to go to the wonderful place of Alexandria, Louisiana. <laughs> so my career in the middle today was great, fantastic, got me off to a good start. Um, after I got out of the Air Force in 1990, right in the middle of a recession, smart of me, right? Um, I wanted to start a business, and I wanted to be a business coach, and we're going to get rid of this. Okay, right here, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I wanted to be a business owner, an entrepreneur. I figured, hey, eight years in the Air Force taught me a lot of things. I want to be a business owner, and that's why I want to get into business. So I went straight to the first thing I could find, and sold shit. Right? <laughs> Anybody ever sold cars? Yes. <laughs> I know some of you have sold cars. Uh, but what I found out in the sales business is that no matter how hard you try and how well you did, in those days, they had what they called a closer, right? So you met the guy who said, hey, this is the deal we're gonna get, and you send him off to the close train and screw everything. Right? <laughs> so I didn't stay that very long. Started my own business, a small, uh, small business, it was uh, safe fire safety equipment. The reason I started the fire safety equipment is because in the Air Force I was part of the safety team, and I got to learn about this little thing called Halon. Anybody ever heard of Halon? Halon fire extinguisher. So it's a gas, you actually spray it, you can spray it right into that computer right there, and it doesn't leave any residue. It puts out the fire. You might have seen it in the movie Terminator, where they put a little button, and it goes shh, turns everything, like, you know, the fire goes out. That's what it was. Very good this. I got to the point where I was making really good money, and uh, had about 20 salespeople under me. Now I remember, I was in California. So what did California do? They said, hey, you know this halo stuff? It's got this one little chemical in there that we don't like. So you need to change the formula, because this is California, and you gotta change it. So I called my distributor in Kentucky, what do you think they said? Screw California, we're not changing it. <laughs> Move to Kentucky, no. So that was gone. Uh, there was business, that was our number one product. I ended up doing sales for a while through Southwestern Bell, and then through Southwestern Bell, I met uh, one of my clients, which was a dentist. He trained me on how to learn everything about dentistry. He said, look, you're really good at what you do, but I can't sell, I can teach you dentistry, so he did. So I spent six months going to his house every night after my first job, learning about dentistry, which he taught me. I then became his administrator. The way that I did it was, he said, I said to him, well, how, how much money are you gonna pay me? He goes, well, I can only pay you about 36,000 a year, uh, plus bonuses, he said that, I was for me. I was making much more than that at the time, but I did it. So here's the deal, he, his, I said, look, what's the best year you've ever had? He said, well, I did 1.2 million last year. I said, well, I'll tell you what, since I'm, you're adding me, how about if I get 20% of the profits of everything above 1.2 million. Now, I never come to find out, he should have told us to get on 1.2 <laughs> Typical dentist, right? But anyway, so he told, he told me that, we did that. I said, well, how long do you think it'll be before I can get a, some kind of bonus? He goes, well, you know, if you work hard and do things well, probably a year or two. Said, All right, six months later, I got my first bonus. The business grew. By the end of the first year, we're doing 2.2 million. So I took all that information, all that knowledge of sales, put it into business, and it works. And here's what it is. Smile, be happy, tell people what you have, right? Give them the benefit from the business. 2.2 million. I was doing really well, maybe more than five doctors there that worked for me, plus 27 assistants. But it's not my business, right? It's a doctor's business. So I did consulting for a while with some other dentists and kind of built a nice business. And one day a friend of mine comes by and says, Jose, I got recruited by this financial company, but I think you'd be good for it. I don't want to do it. I said, well, all right. So I go over and talk to this guy. He goes, 
yeah, look at that. you can build this business, it'll be yours, and you can throw as much money as you want, and it's a great business, you can control your own time, it's wonderful. I said, great, how much does it pay? 24000 <laughs> Okay, I got kids, I got a wife, I gotta go home and tell them. Going from six figures to 24000 Now why am I telling you all these stories? Because I wanna share with you that I took the risk. I said, okay, I believe it. I think I can build a business and make more than I'm making now, and it'll be my business, right? So I did that. Was Edward Jones at the time. Fast forward 22 years later, I wrote my own firm. I managed a little bit around 100 to 500 million dollars. Doing very well, and then now I'm here in front of you today doing a workshop. So that's my, my story. I love what I do. Our slogan is faith, family, finance. There's a reason for that. I do believe in, in faith as being the core to everything. Family, of course, is very important, and then finance third. But I find this, and I don't know if, I, if you guys know anybody like this, but you ever met a wealthy person and they're miserable? Right? I think it's a lot because they don't have that balance. They don't understand that it's without faith, it really doesn't matter, right? But without family, how about that? Have you met people that are very right, wealthy, but their kids are terrible, their family's terrible, everything's terrible, right? Um, so that's why I came up with the slogan back in 2006, Faith, Family, Finance. Now, it's actually kind of common these days. You see it a lot, Faith, Family, Finance. You see it uh, I was at a conference two years ago, and a guy was speaking on, he wrote a book, it's Faith, Family, Friends, and Fitness, I think is what it was. And everybody was all excited about this agenda that they had, but I pulled out my card and said, hey, look, I've been doing this for 10 years. I already had it, so you got me, right? So let's get started. That's a little bit about me. I know it's a lot, but I wanted to kind of get you to know a little bit about why we do what we do. And I did that wrong. So our topics today, small business value discussion topics. Know your value, like most owners don't, principles of valuation, total net worth, and then our retirement, which a lot of, a lot of you here for, what is the rule of thumb and how can I retire? Okay, let me go back one. Because, did everybody catch that? A little thing down here? What? Yeah. That's very important. Read it very fast. Very, read it very fast. I'll read it for you. Nothing contained in this presentation considers location and investment recommendation or any kind of advice. The information contained here and it may contain information that is subject to change without notice. Any investments or strategies referenced here do not take into account the investment or financial situation or particular needs of any specific person. Always consult with your tax professional, financial advisor, or attorney before implementing any investment strategy. Past performance is not indicative of future results. We've all heard of that, right? They have to have this claim. So that's what the compliance department says we have to do, so that's what we do. Next. So, and my notes are over here, so I better grab them and kind of walk back and forth. Small business size, I want to give you some good news. Small business size today are about 30 million U.S. businesses, about 250 million globally. Uh, did you know your numbers? Lack of your business valuation knowledge and financial knowledge about one's business is one of the top two issues facing small business owners, and that is by the Small Business Association. So that's what we're talking about today, valuation. Also some facts, 7.7 uh, .7 million businesses in the next 10 years will change hands in the United States alone, representing over $10 trillion. That's a lot of money. But you know what's funny about that statistic? If you go back, how many are there? 30 million, right? Plus, and only 7 million will be sold. That 75% of the businesses in the U.S. will probably not be sold. Because either they disappear, they had a bad plan, or it just didn't work or the end game comes and the owner goes on and business after it. Or if they do go to sell it, it's not worth much, which is not even worth talking about. So that's what I found in industry. It's not that 7.7 7, 7 million are gonna be sold, but that only 25% of all businesses ever get sold. Okay. There we go. According to 85,000, the fastest growing nine industries going forward are travel and hospitality, media, energy security, real estate, journey and lease, you're probably happy right now because they're growing like crazy. Mm -hmm. Some other things, uh, private industry segments most likely to benefit from tax reform. We all heard about that this year, right? Tax reform. A growing macro economy and regulatory changes include healthcare. Why? Because the population is aging. Construction, especially around here. And get a construction job around here, right? I mean, they can't find good people for the construction they're building. Uh, home starts like crazy. Uh, energy is another one that's uh, coming forward. And then, of course, technology. And the internet, we all know about those things like Facebook, Twitter, all those things that are going on. 
these are all areas that are going to benefit probably from the tax uh, tax laws that we're moving. Okay. So a question that we're here for, what is your business worth? They did a study of IBS World, uh, and the, only 2% of small business owners know their business valuation through 2%. Now, I also read some other studies where they said 25% of business owners knew their valuation. But even at 25%, that's not very much, right? So what happens is, when you're out there doing your job every day, or giving out your, you're selling your big lines, or whatever you're doing out there, you're so focused on your business that you never take time to find out what am I really worth. The only time you really look at it is usually twice. One when you want to sell it, and the other when you need a loan, right? And we'll talk about that and why that's so important. So I thought one of the reasons we want to talk about that today is that it's it's really kind of something we've run into. I had one particular client who came in to me and he said, "Hey, I'm getting ready to retire. Can you come and talk to me about uh, what my business is worth, how I can sell, how I can retire?" So when will you plan on retire next week? <laughs> a little late, right? I mean, we really should have started this a couple of years ago. So yes, and he didn't know what his business was worth. So your business value. If you don't know what your business is worth, which is usually your life's asset, how can you plan for retirement? Most business owners overvalue their business. That's one thing that I see it constantly. Another business came to me and said, it's a family business. We've been in it for 30 years. We'd like to retire, hopefully this year. Okay, well, what do you think your business is worth? Easy 20, 30 million. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I knew the business. I was like, uh, well, why do you say that? He says, well, I have this warehouse, I have these trucks, I have this, I have that, and plus we're doing XYZ uh, revenue a year. Okay, so how much do you make? Oh, I make 80 grand a year. Okay, so who's going to pay you $30 million to get an $80,000 a year job? And you've seen the look on her face, she was like, what do you mean? I said, well, if you sell the business, really they're just replacing you, right? <laughs> so are they gonna really make a lot of money? But they're gonna pay you 20, 30 million so they can get an $8,000 like paying job? Yeah, but my brother's gonna be gone too. Okay, well he makes 82, so that's 160 now. So I'm gonna give you 20, 30 million dollars so I can make 160. Probably not gonna happen. Not only that, turns out this was right after the recession hit. So guess what the business did? Went like this, right? So I gave them the bad news. I said, yeah, you're probably worth about two million, which is good news. Bad news is you can't retire. You gotta build a business. Which they've been doing, by the way, for the last uh, eight or nine years. They're working on it. We're actually going through the process that I'm gonna show you today, and it's uh, gotten better for them. But the problem they had was, because it was a family business, nobody ever really had an extra spread, right? And it, it, they started when they were young, they, the mom kind of gave it to them, and then the, the, two, the brother and the two sisters were working and working and working it. They got to where they're 50 plus, and like, oh, we're tired, the economy's terrible, I want it. I mean, the exact time not to sell your business, and that's what they wanted to do. So business valuation is very important. It's your largest asset, you better take care of it. And don't overvalue it. So why, go ahead. Don't you? I would think in a business like that, you would probably want to groom somebody over a five-year period that now they've got skin in the game, and that way your clients know that person, and then it can be a... Yeah, that's a great succession plan. We'll talk about that. That, that. that is one thing that as a small business owner, it's hard to do because you got I, I tell people all the time, uh, Bill's here in the back, uh, you have Catherine, I tell people all the time, I try to hire people who are better than this. At some point, at some point in time, Starbox Financial, I will be stepping away. And I want Starbox Financial to continue, but I want people around me that are better, that, that are better at what I do, right? And I can tell you, Bill in the back there is a great financial planner. I don't do a whole lot of financial planning, but he's been all about it. But why, do, why don't people value their business, or why don't they take the time to value shit? Well, first of all, it's expensive. I had a client, um, Miguel mentioned her a little bit earlier, and she wanted to evaluate her, her business, so I called the CPA, I said, hey, do you have any idea who I can talk to to value this potential client's business. He goes, yeah, here's three names, you can go talk to them. So the first one was $7,000, just to come out. The second one was 20 grand, but he would be in the business for several weeks. And the last one was 25, just to talk. So that was 7,000, 20,000, 25,000. I told the client, she about to sell something, right? 
What do you mean I gotta pay 25,000 for someone to come and value my business? I said, yeah, that's what they're telling them. So I decided I needed something different, something a better way, more efficient way to get at least a piece of evaluation because there's no way that I'm gonna pay that kind of money. And I'll show you in a little while what we came up with. It's time consuming. They also told us that it would be several weeks within the business of going back and forth, learning everything about the business along with all the financials in order to come up with an appraisal value. All right. It's complicated, what I just talked about, right? The last thing you want in your business is somebody going through all your financials, right? Twice. I got stuff to do, man. Get out of here. No, they have to go through everything. You ever got a bank loan? If you want the bank, same kind of thing, right? They go through all, all your financials backwards and forwards. Or how about not now, right? I'm busy, I'm doing good. Why do I need to do it now? Right? What I would tell you about the now now is, if not now, when? Find out as soon as possible. Because what we're gonna show you is that if you know your value today, that's not necessarily where you're gonna stay, right? You wanna grow it, make it better. You wanna go, what the last thing you wanna do is, Find out that you're not worth anything, right, to anybody, and then decide five years from now, like, okay, it's time to retire. Oh, guess what? Uh, you can't. Because not only did you not save money, but your business isn't worth much. So here's the two ways to value the business. Asset value represents the value of maturity, equipment, buildings, and land, usable stock, and other legal rights. Businesses also, uh, second one is business or goodwill value, represents the premium value the buyer will pay to sell for the organization historically recorded the cash flows. Also, there is an economic incentive to invest capital in the business which has not or, or is realistically not capable of producing a net income in excess of the operator's salary plus a reasonable return on investment. All that is to say, nobody's gonna pay you if they can't make money, right? That's what it really comes down to. Here's the thing about this too, is the second one that I mentioned, the goodwill, what did I just say? The biggest thing about goodwill is everybody overestimates that, right? My business is doing great, my clients love me. Well, yeah, but then you leave, do they love the new guy? Who knows, right? So goodwill, although it can be really, really profitable for you when you sell your business, it can also be a hindrance if you're overvaluing what it's really bringing in. Yes, it, I'll give you an example, I have a, an eye doctor, and come and find out eye doctors practice on worth much. But we did a valuation for him, came in at about a half a million dollars for his, for his uh, practice, but almost all of it was goodwill. It was his client's list. The actual assets didn't matter, right? Even though he owned the building, the building was, you know, in debt up to here. Um, the staff is an expense, and he had some inventory. You can get most glasses online now for five bucks, right? It's kind of hard to sell eight hundred dollar pair of glasses, although you know that's what they are. So we did the valuation, and we came to him and say, "Look, you know, if you get five hundred thousand dollars for your business, you're sixty-three years old. That's not going to last a long time, right?" But he assumed because he had this long list of clients, they would be worth a ton of money, and they're not. Once he found that out, it really was a shocker. And like I said, he's 63, so now the good thing is, he's an ex ex Air Force Colonel, so he's got a pension, but still, his business isn't gonna be nearly worth what he thought it was. So the principles of valuation, right? What a reasonable buyer will pay a reasonable seller. The term reasonable in this context is used in the economic sense. The buyer and seller are each assumed to be comparing alternative investments, and when the economic incentive to purchase people to the economic incentive to sell, a deal is made. All to say is I'm only going to pay you what I think it's worth, right? That's what it comes down to. For valuation purposes, a business is defined as an organized method of producing revenues routinely over a period of time. Accuracy depends on the standard use of terms, methods, disclosures, information. Every report is only as good as the data is based upon. And here's the thing, fourth one is really important. All estimated values are limited by time and subject to change as the market conditions change. Therefore, the value conclusion is valid only for a short time relative to the size and scale of a given business in a given industry in a given market. Bottom line, it's only worth what someone is willing to pay for. That's really the bottom line. And today, right, we're in negotiations for uh, the client thing I mentioned a little bit earlier. And what we're asking for it might not be what we asked for it a year from now, six months from now. If her business continues to grow, we're not gonna sell for the price that we're asking for today. Right? 
vice versa, if her business starts to go down, it might not be worth what she's asking for today. One of the things people always ask me, when's the best time to sell? When you can get the best price. That's the best time to sell. So how do we assess all this? Anybody ever heard of it before? We all heard of it, right? So attorneys before you kiss taxes, depreciation, and amortization. In the past years, there have been a number of articles criticizing EBITDA and multiple thereof that determine the company's value. Why is EBITDA important? Because that's what a lot of consultants use to get a valuation started for your business. But what we're finding out here in 2018, it's an old way of looking at things sometimes. So that's what we're going to cover. And the reason being is um, the, the data of the looking evaluation means that it's a multiple of EBITDA. So whatever your final EBITDA is, usually they'll come up with a multiple, it can be two, three, nine. One thing that's very curious about multiples that you should know when you're selling your business is when the economy's good, multiples are happy. Right? Because they're really happy and we've got money. So one of the things I teach us when I, when I teach a, a, a lot of small businesses is you want to sell when things are great, not when things are bad. When you're going gangbusters and you're doing well and you're getting close to retirement age, you should be thinking about selling that business at a peak, not when then things have turned the other way and you start getting frustrated and you don't like work anymore. Okay. So EBITDA has some drawbacks, and here they are. There's a but that has not, it is not cash flow. It does not show the actual cash available to service debt, pay on her salary. It has not been multiple in comparing companies that depreciation and amortization treatment compared between companies. It does not include changes in long term debt. It does not represent the amount of cash available to a hypothetical buyer interested in acquiring the subject business. There are others, but the key finding is that it does not truly reflect the availability of cash, the availability of the company to service the debt sustain its operation and grow its potential. One of the things about that, the reason we're putting this up is because we're going to show you that there's other ways to value the business and we're going to use that for the software that, that we have available for you and what we're doing. One thing I found curious this morning, and I got to get my phone for this, about cash flow, right? I think you guys find this human, so uh, here, pull this up. I took this photo this morning. And I, so, anybody know who WeWork is? Yeah. Heard of it? Yeah. So, this is a cash flow problem for WeWork. So, they have $18 billion in rent due right now. And they're asking for an $18 billion loan from the bondholders. Would you give them money? That's after they spent $1.9 billion. Billion of the B. To me, that's a cash flow problem, right? You're spending a lot of money, you got a lot of stuff, and you know, now where do you get it, right? So if, uh, yeah, their Intel is good, but their cash flow problem is really, really bad. So how else can we value things? Put this back. Discretionary earnings. This formula is described as normalized pre-tax profits after limiting non-operating and non-operating items, owner compensation, um, non cash charges, discretionary earnings. Discretionary earnings or seller's discretionary earnings, as we often call it, adjusted cash flow, is a more profitable measure of cash flow as it accounts for the tax minimizing behavior by firm owners and revolves around a return on owner's labor uh, rather than a return on investment paradigm. Right? Paradigm. I, I hate that word. So, not only is it, uh, cash flow easy. Now that the cash flow is very important, here's another reason. This is from our friend over at Ross Bank. He gave me this. I asked him, I said, so how do you look at a business when you're going to give a loan, right? Um, based on what? And he told me, it's all about cash flow. A bank focuses part of cash flow available to service the debt, and the yield on bank loan is minimal. The risk appetite is much lower. Sustained cash flow is a stronger counter to a bank's risk because they're going to give you money, they're taking their own risk, right? So they want to know how they can get paid back. The same thing that applies for a loan is also the same thing that applies on how when you go sell a business. Because the, business, the new business owner wants to see how much money he's gonna make, right? Based on his investment, what's his risk. So do not focus on minimizing your taxable income without disclosure to the lender. This is his stuff. When bank financing is needed, it is pertinent for the business owner and the CPA bookkeeper to be aware. While minimizing taxable income is beneficial to the owner, 
It can sometimes prevent him or her from obtaining the necessary level of financing if not properly disclosed to the lender. What does that mean? You and I all do the same thing. We make money and we're going to try to hide it from Uncle Sam, right? We're going to try to reduce everything from the most possible. I'm telling you, as a business owner, you got to start looking at it a little differently. You can't always try to get the lowest tax or the most tax savings because that cuts down on what your cash flow really is. So it's very, very imperative when you look at loans. One of the things I find out about loans, you might find this funny or not, but they always are willing to give you a loan when you don't need it, right? When you need it, they're like, yeah, you can't afford it, so no, sorry. And that's why, why? Because the cash flow we do the business owners, we focus on how to save, 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 not pay taxes, not pay taxes, and make money, but not as much as Uncle Sam. Well, what you're doing is you're, you're cutting your own throat. Because if your goal is to sell the business or to get a loan, they're gonna look at that cash flow. How much are you really making? We don't care what you're paying Uncle Sam, we care what you're really making, because if I'm gonna give you $10 million, you better be able to pay it, all right? Now you'll say, well, of course I can pay it, I just wrote it off over here. <coughs> They'll say, sorry, you wrote it off, we can't take it into account. A perfect example, and, and um, the gentleman in Frost that gave you this, he told me this story. So he had a, a business that he's gonna do a loan for, it was in the multi millions of dollars. So he was excited. He's a young guy. He's like, finally did my first multi million dollar. Got through the whole process, got all the way done and ready, and I'm ready and rejected it. He's like, everything's good. What happened? He goes, you remember all that machinery he had? All that equipment he had? It's no one in books. So we can't give him a loan on something that doesn't exist. Because what he had done is hit it, right? So he didn't have to pay taxes on it. That's great. But not so great when you're trying to get a loan or you're trying to get a business because what would happen is somebody was getting the loans to buy that business for multi millions of dollars. The current owner was going to retire in his sleep. But now, because of what he did in the past, by not showing the cash flow, not showing the assets to buy a loan. Long story short, he's still with his company. The company wasn't bought out. Bad dead end. So, when you're looking at your business, make sure that when you talk to your CPA or your tax preparer, Take that into account. You know, I'm not saying don't take everything you can. I'm saying be careful about taking everything you can. Because if your end goal is to retire with your business and sell it to somebody else, they're not gonna care about all the tax savings that you get. They're gonna care about what's the bottom line, how much did you make in profit that I can pay for and I can add to my life for the future, right? So very, very important. It's a different way of looking at things. Every day I get told every day from my tax account to my CPA, do this, do that, save here, save there, and then I make as little as possible, right, so I don't pay the IRS, which is great. But if I go to sell my business, they don't care about that. They care about what it means. So very, very important. So here's the, here's the part that will, uh, you see out here, there's a bunch of sample reports. What we have for you today is uh, when, I, when I have that client that I talked about earlier, and she didn't want to pay the seven thousand and ten thousand dollars to get a get a valuation. What I did is I remembered about ten years ago I was at a conference and this guy came to me and said, "Hey, I have this software that helps you evaluate your business." So it was about ten years ago. I thought, "Hmm, I wonder if he's still around." So I called him. I had his number somewhere in my Rolodex to date myself a little bit. Uh, and I called him. And he said, "Yeah, we still have. It. Matter of fact, it's way better than it used to be." So. so Tell, tell me what it is. So what they've done, everything we talked about, discretionary cash flow, everything we talked about, they took and created an algorithm, a software, that you can put in three years worth of tax returns into the software, industry specific, with a database of over 32 million businesses in it, and it's about a 22 page report with what your business is about in about two minutes after you put in the data. And it's approved by the American Factors Association as a valuation for your business. So you can take something that costs seven or ten thousand dollars, and because you came to the workshop today, you can do it for free. All you do is you go to our online website, you go to business analysis. That's what I was trying to show you, so you can see it. So the software, what it does, it takes three years of tax returns. You put it into it. You put it into specific. It doesn't take your social security numbers. It does get your name, a very minimal information. It is secure. You put it in there, and out fits the twenty-page report. Uh, with all your valuation, and what I want to show you is sample, which is what I'm trying to click on. But in it, it'll give you your equity value, your asset value, and um, any valuation that you want to actually sell the business. We've tested this now, we've done this for about 20 different uh, businesses or so, 
and every single one come back almost to a T with the consultant, with the bank, or the tax person. Remember, I told you about the $500,000 um, uh, optical uh, doctor that I had? He actually thought he was worth a lot more. The CPA said, no, nah, you're worth about 500000 When we did the software, it came in at four fifty eight. I mean, it was almost exactly what the CPA had come up with. And that was industry specific to his industry. So if you have a business today, whatever it is, you can go on to our website, click on it. It's free to you. You enter three years worth of tax return and out on the report. I mean, what's that? What's the answer? I'll get I'll get these for you for you at that. I mean, I can't tell you everything we've talked about to be able to be spit out in about two minutes. Is unbelievable. The software is amazing. We we have a license for it. Uh, normally they charge five hundred dollars to do the report. Uh, if you go directly to them, we don't charge our time. And because you're here today, we don't charge for that. What do we get out of it when the report's done? It doesn't turn out for you. We 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 actually we get it and we sit down with you here. Here's the report. We're not trying to sell you nothing. We just go through it so you can see what it is. If you have any questions, great. If you don't, fantastic. Here you go. Have a nice day. Let's see when you get to retire or when you when you plan to retire. Obviously for us, if you plan to retire somewhere in the future, that's good good help that we can get involved. But it's really go ahead. Would it also be the tool as to where when you learn your evaluation date, you would be differently than what you've done in the past to increase? Absolutely. Your absolutely, yes. You're absolutely right. What you just said is very, very important. What we want to get to is once you know your worth for your business and you want to know your total net worth. This is something very, very important that you should, need. you should be doing this every year, no matter what, whether you own a business, don't own a business. As a family, you should get together and find out what your total net worth is. And basically it's this, what you have as an asset or money against all your debts, right? You minus those, so you come out with a net worth. What I do every year, uh, my wife and I do around Christmas time, uh, that week before, before the New Year's, Christmas and New Year's, we almost always get together for a weekend or a couple days, and we look at, okay, how do we end up the year how are we looking for next year? How are we going to increase our net worth? Right? And the reason we do that is because when it's all said and done, when you retire, you want to live out of your net worth. Right? Uh, and that includes your business. So it's very, very important. You, should, you need to do two things when you're running a business, too, and this is very, very important. There's two sets of money. There's money for saving, right? And what I mean by that is your short-term money. That's the money for operations. That's the money you need to pay your bills. You should always have that money in the bank, CDs at best. That is not investment dollars. Now, everything else above that, everything you don't need for that, then that becomes investment dollars. And that's what you also want to include for your future. One of the biggest mistakes people make in small business is they only invest in their business, right? They're like, hey, my retirement my business, I don't need to invest in the stock market, I don't need bonds, I don't need real estate. My business is my, my, my investment. Huge, huge mistake, why? Because Let's say you're here doing great, your business is going fantastic. Three years from now, we have a recession, your, your business gets cut in half, you get sick, you need to retire. Now what? Right? And I've seen that time and time again where things are going great, no investment other than the business, business goes under, now you're working for the rest of your life. Right? Very important to look at your net worth every single year and, and make sure that you're growing it not just in your business, but also through investments and other assets like stocks, bonds, real estate, commodities, things like that. Next thing I want to show you, so here it is. So you found out what you're worth, right? Let's say you're worth a million dollars. What does that create for you for your future? Here it is. A million dollars creates about $45,000 a year. Now that's pre-tax, that's no taxes included. That's a 4.5% return. We tell our clients that you can probably safely get about 6% on the return, so you can get 45,000 per million and still grow the business, still grow the income. That's a good normal, correct? You don't want to run out of money. And the average nowadays is not 75 years old. People are living 80, 90. My grandfather was 96. My great grandfather was 103 when he died. Lightly, my dad's 83 right now, going strong. Lightly, I'll probably live into my 90s. So if I retire at 65 and I live to 95, that's 30 years of income that I have to come up with to live off. That's a lot of money. Okay. How many people are surprised by that, by the way? 45,000 per million. It's not a lot, is it? A lot of people don't understand that. One of the things that's very good about working for the government 
or for you know some kind of um, public job where you get a pension, it's worth a lot when you get an eighty thousand dollars a year pension. That's two million bucks, right? Or how about when you get? I have a client right now who worked for the police force thirty two years. Love it, um, unbelievable dedication. He makes hundred and fifty five thousand dollars a year for the rest of his life. I said, do you realize that's over $3 million that somebody has to set aside so they can pay you $155,000? Now, multiply this in California. Now, multiply that times hundreds of those guys retire. You can see why California has a $90 billion problem, right? Because you have to have the assets in order to create the income. Um, okay, there we go. The report looks like this. Uh, the contents, you see there. This is a manufacturing facility, for example. Gives you uh, all the information you get earlier as to how they do the valuation and performance indicators that they use. All the normal information that they give you. Everything we talked about today, by the way, the methodology here is. So this one's a little bit on the high side, but there's your valuation. So when you put in your three years of tax returns, uh, out comes this valuation based on asset value, enterprise value, liquidation value. You can see this is what it's worth, this particular manufacturing facility. And like I said, the wonderful thing about it is, from what I, uh, testing you've done, it's pretty right on. Once you put it in there, people go, no, no, I want this much. The industry says they're not. This is what it's worth. I have one right now, the guy has nine feet to place. And he came to me and says, yeah, I think I'm worth about four million. Well, okay. The valuation came back at 25 million. He says, yeah, but everybody in the industry tells me X, Y, Z. Yeah, but if you're pocketing $4 million, somebody's willing to pay for that, right? I mean, I, I would, right? I'd put up 20 million to get four million a year. I get paid back very quickly. We did one for a gas station. Um, the gentleman went to, 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 to buy it. He's like, what do you think? I said, well, let's see, what's the, what's the cash flow? $680,000 a year in income for a $2.3 million gas station. Worth it? Yeah. Absolutely. Gets his money back in four years. He's back. So at the fourth year, he's all profit, right? By the way, he was profitable after the second year, not the first year, because of, he did some loans and things like that, some paybacks, um, a few other things. But that's really what people look for, right? He tried to buy a business before that, the business cost three million and was making one hundred sixty thousand dollars a year. Good deal. Probably not, right? So we turned that one down. Went to the gas station, which, by the way, we never even thought of buying a gas station. But when we saw the numbers, unbelievable. I think it's kind of it's, the fact is, if they come up out the business, they love it. It's fantastic. He's doing great job for everyone in Arizona. He's loving life. Um, so that's one. You can see there's more to it than that. Uh, we can go through it. Here's the financial summary of what he put in. Right. So it tells you your income, your assets, your liabilities, um, everything taken to account. One time um, revenues too. Sometimes you'll have uh, something where you pay for something one year, but you don't normally pay for it. You can put that in there also. There's the yearly financial summary. So this is what he, he put in as far as data. By the way, one of the things that we offer our uh, you know, for today, it's not only can you do it for free, but if you actually don't have the time, call us. Uh, our wonderful assistant Catherine back there is pretty experienced at this. You send her three years worth of tax returns, she'll put in the data for you, you can report already for you. You don't have to take the time to do it yourself. We can do it for you. Um, it's 20, 20 some pages long, so for now, I just want to show you that you can actually go back here. This is what the website like. So you asked me earlier. So starfoxfinancial.com, go under business, business analysis, and you, you'll see this page come up. Starfoxfinancial.com, business valuation tool is one of the, the um, services you'll see. When you click on it, you can put your business, your zip code, your industry. When you click on it, when you start typing industry, all the industry codes come up. So whatever industry code, it'll give you some choices in there. It's not just what you decide. There are actually some industry codes in there. There's like hundreds of them in there. So when you put, let's say you put travel, 
uh, you start to try to travel, all of a sudden all these codes come up and you can pick which one actually is you. So it's not that you have to come up with it, so it makes it very, very easy. We're running low on time. Okay. Let's see if we can get back to the screen. Yeah, perfect. Right to the home. One last thing before I round up. You saw the retirement, right? The biggest thing you guys remember, it's about 45,000 per million. Get that in your head now because if you don't have that in your head, when you retire, you might not have enough money. That's one. Two, create a team. Now, obviously, Starbucks Financial, we want to be part of that team, but it could be anybody that's up your financial advisor. What I would just suggest and recommend to you is you don't necessarily have to use us, but use somebody like us. What I mean by that, you want to use a registered investment advisor. A registered investment advisor is a fiduciary. They have to do what's in your best interest. If you go to uh, Edward Jones, a Merrill, a Morgan Stanley, uh, any one of the top uh, broker firms out there, they are not fiduciaries. They work for the company, they don't work for you. We, like other registered investment advisors, work for you. So we're gonna go out there, we're gonna find the best investment we can, the best product we can, the lowest prices we can, to help you reach your financial goals. But it shouldn't just be us. You should have a team. You should, you should, your CPA and your financial advisor should be talking on a regular basis. Your attorney, you should have an attorney, somebody you can turn to. Don't wait until you need them. You want to have a relationship with an attorney ahead of time to put the structure of your company together, to do the things that are legal advice that you need as you're growing the business. Uh, also, the advisor and the CPA should know the attorney, right? So many times you go to a meeting and like, yeah, I don't have an attorney. Can you pick one for me? Okay, I can, but shouldn't you have been already had some kind of relationship so it can work with your business? Your business team shouldn't be just your staff. Your business team should be your staff plus this circle that we created, along with your commercial banker. Commercial banker can come real handy because especially with a small bank, if they get to know your business, sometimes they'll lend to you when they, they can bend a little bit sometimes, right? Especially with a small bank. Now, the big bank, usually they have criteria that they can't bend. So you should always have a good commercial bank, a good CPA, and a good business attorney. It's utmost importance. And by the way, a CPA and an attorney is also a fiduciary. So if you have a financial advisor that's a fiduciary, you have a CPA that's a fiduciary, you have an attorney that's a fiduciary, all that means is they're all working for you in your best interest. They're not just trying to sell you some product, right? That's the biggest thing in our industry, which I'm definitely against, is that yesterday, we went to a, um, a jeweler and he was telling me what he bought from his CPA for retirement. And it was an insurance product. And immediately my red flags go up, right? I've been in this business 22 years. I'm like, insurance, retirement, that doesn't go hand in hand. And from a CPA, boom, problem, right? As we started discussing what he was trying to do and what he actually got sold, two different stories. He just paid a lot of money for something he didn't need. All right. So that's very important that you have a good team working around you at all times. And of course, that would be a good team. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> you see Bill in the back and Catherine in the back and Everett's are our gentlemen out in California and the kids are animals. One of the things that I also tell people is that not only should you have a good financial advisor, but that financial advisor should be working for you and your future and looking how to avoid risk, right? Because that's all really a CPA does, is they're trying to avoid taxes. Attorneys trying to avoid to get legally sued. What we're doing is trying to avoid the risk in the markets, right? A good advisor will help you not lose 50% like in 2008, 2009, right? Because if they're looking to reduce and mitigate your risk, then you won't be caught up in the wash, right? One of the things I saw in 2005, um, when I was in California, in our area, and I'm, this might shock you guys if you're all from Texas, our housing prices from 2006 peak to the bottom was 70% down in value. I sold my house in 2005. I told every client, sell everything you got, unless you're planning on being there for 30 years because the market's gonna crash. And how did I know that? Well, obviously through research. But one of the things I, I was on the PTA, right? After you heard, I was on the school board, and I was on the school board in, in, um, in California. 
I was at a PTA meeting, which there aren't called PTAs anymore, they're called something else, but they're correct. And there were nine ladies and myself. The only reason I was the only guy is just because I have my control of my own time, and this was during the week at about 10 a.m. on a Tuesday morning, for example. Of the nine ladies in 2005, spring of 05, seven of them became real estate agents. And within a month, we're making thousands and thousands of dollars. No experience. Right? Ding, 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 something's wrong. If somebody off the street can come in and start making $300,000 a year like that, there's some bubbles there, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where I started my research. Sure enough, found out that credit markets went through the roof. I had a cousin, not true story, cousin making 10 bucks an hour, but a $500,000 house in Southern California. <laughs> Needless to say, he lost it up in the year later, right? And I asked him how he got the loan. He says, well, I just wrote that one on me. I said, well, how much did you make? I said, well, I make 10 bucks an hour. Well, how much did you write down? A lot more than that, right? True story. When I saw these things, a good advisor will pick up on these things and say, hey, hey time out. Something's wrong, right? <clears throat> and that's what we do. So not only are we providing you with tools like the guys you're putting yourself today, and hopefully you'll take advantage when you, when you leave here today, but also good advice for your business, for your family, um, that will get you through to your goals, which are usually retirement, right? Usually making a good living in retirement. Um, and as you know, for a good retirement, at least today, I know it takes about 80 to 100 grand to live. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but that's about what it takes, right? Um, for that, you need $2 million, one way or another. Right. Then you need more liquid cash. Liquid not, cash, yes. Not your real estate and your whatever. Yeah, I had, you're absolutely right. I had this discussion with someone yesterday at a meeting. She was saying, well, I have three houses. That's if you're retirement. Okay, so the rental. She goes, yes. I said, so when you retire, you like it when nobody's paying you? Because eventually the rentals, something happens, right? They either leave, or they stop paying, or they destroy your house. I mean, I've never seen anybody who rents a house, and I have a client that has 13 of them, where the house was always rented all the time, every day. I've never seen that happen. Anybody seen that? So yes. They provide income, but they also provide a hell of headaches. And he's in California, where the biggest thing in California is, who's better protected, the homeowner or the renter? The renter by far. So you just put yourself in, well, that's why I'm pretty good, right? You just put yourself in a big liability issue. If the renter in California, if the renter stops paying, he's there for six months without paying you a dime. Nothing you can do about it. I mean, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like good retirement to me. Right. Anyway, so that's our team. Questions? Before I get uh, finished on the question, though, I want to read something to you. This is, uh, you guys, everybody have quotes that they like? Anybody? I keep quotes around all the time. So here's my quote. And uh, you know, I told you my life story, so you probably know why I like this quote. But here it is, I'll tell you what it It's not the critic who counts. Not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust, sweat, and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, and comes short again and again, because there is not, not ever without error and shortcomings, but who, who does actually strive to do the deed, who knows the great enthusiasm, the great devotion, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly. So that his place shall never be but those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. There you go. So I live my life by that, that credit always. You know, I'm not perfect. I, a lot of people say, hey, Jose, how come you're, you're such a good advisor? You've been 22 years. I say the same thing every time because I failed a lot. So I've made a lot of mistakes. This software, please take advantage of it. It's a fantastic tool that I'm giving you today. Um, you know, take advantage of it. Get to know what your business is really worth. Start today. Find out where I'm at. Where do I want to be? Get with an advisor soon. Don't wait until it's too late. All right? Any questions? Where are you located? Ah, that's a question. That's a good question. We're on the corner of Grogan's Mill and Timberlock. Uh -huh. 10077 Brooklyn. 
And we have in the package all our information in the package, obviously. So, questions? You get them? No? Good. Thank you for being here. It's, uh, you know, to me, uh, I hope that you learned something today. And most of all, I hope you take advantage of the tools that provided for you. You'll see when you go online. Unfortunately, we couldn't test it because of my lack of technology. But uh, go on there, go on starpackfinancial.com. Um, take advantage of it. And when it's done, we'll come out and we'll go through the, uh, the whole report. With you. By the way, one last thing. From one of the statistics I didn't cover, but it's up there 50% of small businesses are underinsured. The report also gives you a, 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 a valuation on what, how you should be insured, how much insurance you should have. We don't sell insurance, but it's a great tool that's in there, too. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you.